In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's gospel lesson reminds me of a presentation I once gave at work during a team building event called There's No I in Team, But There Is in Lisa. It is the I in today's gospel that I think trips us up the most, and it's the I that tripped up the rich man in this story. It can be tempting to try to get to the root of what Jesus is teaching so quickly that we miss the point of the passage anyway. It's easy to try to slot ourselves into the characters that we see and then move on. And I think maybe mentally it could go something along the lines of this. Am I the rich person? Well, who said I was poor? Oh, wait, no. I'm rich because I do have money, but I'm a better rich person than the rich man because I'm positive I wouldn't have ignored Lazarus. I would have helped him out. Or maybe, um, I don't think Jesus was really talking about money because people's money and their wealth is directly tied to how hard they're willing to work. So if someone is poor like Lazarus, it's because they're lazy. And while I'm at it, can you believe so-and-so went out to eat? See, this is why they have no money. It's like our heartbeat is calling out, not money, please, God, anything but money. But if we act as if this parable isn't about our relationship with money, then we find ourselves back in the position of thinking we're a good person just because we found someone to compare ourselves to who might be an even bigger hot mess than we ourselves are. And friends, that's not what our faith is supposed to be built on. This kind of comparison can be difficult for us not to do. And if it is for you, I think we should take a second to look at our relationship to money. Because no matter how we try to make it not about money, we are rich as the world sees it, and Lazarus is at the gate. There's a Lazarus at our gate, so what are we going to do about it? All throughout the Old Testament, we see God's care for the poor. And some of my favorite are passages from the Psalms, those great songs. One of them goes, you would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Or another one that goes, for he delivers the needy when they call, the poor and those who have no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life. Precious is their blood in his sight. The way we use our money and the way that its use affects both us and the people around us matters a lot to God, and it should to us. We can either use it for ourselves only or use it to show compassion to a hurting world around us. It is, after all, very hard to go through the eye of the needle. Lazarus was at the rich man's gate, and this wasn't a secret. Any person walking by would have noticed him. I mean, you've got dogs licking the sores on his, on his feet. That's something you tend to see. He stayed at the gate. He slept at the gate. Not a comfy bed, but on the hard ground, and maybe at best he had some discarded sack. He didn't even have the benefit of cardboard to lay on. It wasn't invented back then. Did he smell? Probably. Pretty strong. Was he in the way? Absolutely. He wasn't unnoticeable unless you chose to not notice him. So that's what it appears was done by the rich man. He didn't notice Lazarus. He was happy being focused on himself, his sumptuous feasts, and his good time, stepping over Lazarus on his way out the door for the day. He didn't see a need for more. No need for Lazarus, no need for Abraham. When he found himself in hell, the reality of it was it really wasn't that, that different than his life. He still was, after all, alone. The only thing that was missing from the time he was alive was money. 
His life was hell. His death was hell. And it was because he'd picked money over everything. Yesterday, members from the Diocesan Mosaic Committee got together in the lounge here, and we had a viewing, a, a movie night or a movie day. I had popcorn and watched the 2008 documentary called Traces of the Trade, a story from the deep north. It was so interesting. And if, like, as I describe it, if any of you think, oh, wow, I'd love to see that, please talk to me after the service because I will do whatever I have to to get you a copy of the CD. It really was good. In it, we were introduced to the DeWolf family of Rhode Island. They settled there in the late 1700s and early 1800s, and they were fantastic people, upstanding citizens. There were priests, there were deacons, there were senators. They were respected by the town. They were loved by everyone. They had a beautiful house. They were wealthy. They really had it going on. They also happened to be the largest slave traders in the history of the U.S., and they were personally responsible for the enslavement of 10,000 slaves that they traded in the slave trade between Ghana, Cuba, and Rhode Island. In the film, some of the descendants of this family tried to come to terms with their, their family's past. 200 were invited, but 10 showed up to go on a tour of their old home in Rhode Island, which let's not kid ourselves, it was a mansion and impressive and beautiful and built by slaves. They toured the forts and castles of Ghana where the slave trade occurred, where they would have traded for slaves. And then they went to Cuba where they would drop off the slaves at the DeWolf plantation so that they could produce more rum to take to Rhode Island, to take to Ghana, to trade for slaves and repeat over and over and over again. They operate at a time when the slave trade was illegal. In the film, while they were touring a fort in Ghana, they toured five small cramped dark basement rooms where they would have held the slaves who were ready to be transported to Cuba. They would have held five, or I'm sorry, 1,000 people shackled together in these five small rooms. And it was while in the room that one of the ancestors, or one of the descendants of the DeWolf families commented, I used to think that they just didn't know any better, that this was their culture at the time. But now after seeing this, I can see that it was an evil thing. They knew it was wrong and they did it anyway. The rich men in this scenario loved money so much that they built an empire by stealing away the lives of others. At their center was the love for money. I want to return to our gospel lesson just for a moment. The bit where the rich man calls out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my, and cool my tongue for I'm in agony in these flames. It says, it says if either, even in death, he couldn't imagine, imagine Lazarus any more than a slave to follow his orders. In death, as in life, he stayed in the place he created, willing to trample on Lazarus. The real reason he was in hell was because that, that was what he had chosen. His wealth allowed him to live in an empty, isolated, and self-focused world and not noticing others. It was that way before he died and that way after he died. But before we go too far with that, a final thought I'd like to share you from today's gospel is just the reminder that if you take a parable out too far, things tend to fall apart. Remember, this is a parable. There's more to it than even what was being taught. It may have been too late for the rich man. He had no way to erase the distance that he'd created. But the good news for us is that it's not too late. God sent us his son to die for us, to erase the distance that we built up with him. And all we need to do is ask. Amen.
Now comes time for the sermon conversation. So if you're joining us online, drop a comment, ask a question. If you're here in person, you can also just pull up Facebook or YouTube and do it there. Or you can text to the number that is in your bulletin and it'll drop into the queue and we'll... Yeah, stump we'll, us. We'll this have is a kind of, Right, yeah, throw us a question yeah. here. You know, try to, try to stump the preacher. Forget it. Thank you for making us all uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> there are like three things you're not supposed to talk about in company, right? Money, sex, and religion. And the Bible pushes all three on us, doesn't it? <laughs> and here we are. Yeah. And speaking as the rector, we do a lectionary cycle. So Father Aaron did not choose the readings for today. None of us did. They were chosen decades ago and repeat on a cycle every three years. And as the rector, I wish, like the past four or five Sundays has been about money. Mm -hmm. Why can't we have that in October and November when we do stewardship? <laughs> then the readings won't talk about money at all. We're just Here wetting we people's appetite okay. to get ready. Yeah. So, because I always remember what happened last week and the week before. <laughs> so, uh, a comment came in uh, asking about how Jesus is last week was talking to the Pharisees and seems to be talking to the Pharisees again this week. So. Did the Pharisees become the power center as a, in that culture as opposed to God being the power center? Like when it came to things like money and religion, were, were they trying to sort of muscle in on God's territory, maybe unwillingly so, but, or unknowingly so? But anyways, it was, it was just... Or, know, or knowingly. Or knowingly. Yeah. And yeah, trying to sort of push an agenda. Thank you, Father Aaron, for making it worse. <laughs> <laughs> it's a comment that came in. <laughs> but it's, it's one thing to think about all this stuff as an individual, right? And that's important. But now, isn't the church what the Pharisees were? Yeah. And it's also important for us how we think about money and whether God is on the throne in the church's life, as well as for us as individuals. And what does the church look like when our focus is on God? So I thank you for that comment, yeah. whoever that was, but thank you. Yeah. Uh, another person sent in something, uh, a, a, a Facebook image of women in Africa carrying water on their heads. And the caption says, if hard work guaranteed wealth, then African women would be the wealthiest people on earth. So, alluding to what you talked about, yeah. like, you know, well, the poor people, they're lazy. That's why they don't and, have anything. And, uh, well, I get, maybe not obviously. I don't actually believe that, or at least I hope I don't. No, yeah. But I think sometimes in our unguarded moments, we so easily put people down that those are the types of things that we find ourselves saying or thinking. And it might surprise us, but those are the things that we say or think. Do some people not work hard? Sure. Of course. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll, I'll confess in front of everybody, I've, I've, had, I've had days where I don't work very hard because my mind's not in it or I just feel I don't downtrodden. Know if, I don't yeah. know if I believe that. I've seen your TikToks. <laughs> That's not working. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes we don't. We are complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And God sees our complications. Yeah. I remember one time in college, it was... I guess the year between my junior and senior year, I was in the Soviet Union, and at that point we were in Kiev. Um, and I, I actually was almost mugged. I had a large group of people who were trying to carry me away and steal oh my, my money belt and things like that. And other than perhaps cussing in Russian, um, I also was just so outraged because I'm like, I'm not even rich. Come on. I'm just a poor college student. What are you doing? But it was well that like kind of like in the midst of that turmoil, I'm like, actually, I am rich. I mean, mm. I'm a poor college student. Oh, boo hoo, poor me. I have the luxury of going to college, yeah. you know, and it's like, I, I think sometimes we forget some of the things that we have that are actually such they're huge. I have the opportunity to go to college or I have an opportunity to learn a trade or, you know, I think it's easy to think that person's richer than me. So, you know, that's on them, not I'm in the same boat. 
you mentioned that the rich man didn't even notice Lazarus. And now it sounds like sometimes, and you were using yourself as an example, we don't notice the things in ourselves mm -hmm. that might be detracting from the things of God or detracting from our, the, the loved ones yeah. in our lives. And we don't notice things sometimes. And shame on us for not, but as you said, we're human and we screw this up. Thankfully, there is grace in our failings. One more thing. I always like to commend the Old Testament to you. Mm. And today is one of my favorite Old Testament passages of all time. Um, Genevieve, <laughs> I know it was, it's, it's a tough one, but it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's legal stuff. What's going on is a legal real estate transaction. That's what's going on. So it's, it's about money. But it's about more than that because money is always about more than that. What's happening is Jeremiah is in jail in a pit in the ground because he said that God says the Babylonians are going to come in and wipe everybody out. Israel will be no more. That's what's going on. He's in jail for saying that. And he knows that the Babylonians are going to come in and wipe the whole nation out. And what does God do? God sends his cousin to have him invest in family real estate. <laughs> Not the time to invest in real estate. That's throwing your money away. But God said, buy the land, because even though the woes, the, the bad things that I promised are going to happen, even though they haven't happened yet, I'm already planning your restoration. Not bad. Remember that you were once slaves. And God noticed you. God noticed. So you must now notice those who are on the underside of power. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Deacon Lisa. Thank you. Thank you.